Our reading comes from the 14th chapter of John, the 23rd through the 29th verses. Hear now the good news. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. And now, and now you may see. I want you to look at the image on the screen. Christ with his hands out. Think of that image as we go through the sermon, and when we get to communion, think of that image as you come forward to receive, hands together. This whole thing is about Jesus preparing to leave his disciples. It needed more than an ordinary goodbye because he had changed the lives of those who had followed him. They expected that he would be some sort of military leader. And yet he's handing off the task of ministry to them and helping them understand that things happen because God wishes it to be so. And they needed to know what would happen and they also needed to know that with Christ they would be prepared to handle it. Do you ever hear mom say some final words before you left the house, especially once you became a teenager driving? Sometimes it was dad, and sometimes it was one of your grandparents, but don't stay out too late. Drive carefully. If your friends start getting into trouble, walk away. And if you need us to, call us and we will come get you. Nowadays, we might add things like no texting and driving. It's a parental concern, wanting our best, even though we didn't always hear it that way. But the words were appropriate and well-meaning and genuinely concerned, like any good parent would be. And for the gospel today, although it's not Jesus being their parent, he's had that kind of a leadership role over the disciples, and he's trying to help them understand what they're going to need, and especially what they're going to need to remember as they go along this ministry without him. They are his parting words so that they will stay in the disciples' ears and they can call it up when they, they wonder what Jesus would do. This was the night before his death. He was saying a final goodbye. But he was also looking forward to 40 days past the next day to Ascension, 40 days past Easter. So not only were those words appropriate for that moment, they were appropriate into the future as well. He understood that. He needed the disciples to understand that. Those words, although they were addressed directly to the disciples, come down the years of the church to us and it's our last words from the Lord too that his peace be with us not the kind of peace that we think about 
but his, which is totally different from any kind of peace that the world can give. His last words come down to three words, love, peace, and gratitude. We've been talking about God's love for several weeks now. And in the Lord's last words to his disciples on Monday, Thursday, Jesus talks about the love that his people have for him. He knows that he is loved. And then he tells us that love is not just an emotion. It is something that is like a verb. You have to put it into action. Christian love is an acceptance of everyone, but it's also a filtering back to those who've not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It's also a way of showing by the way we live that God loves all people. And especially when we start thinking about um, some of the things that have happened on the street, and especially this little boy that was carrying a fake gun that when you put him next to the real gun looked so much like a real thing and the chief of police this morning said what do you want us to do when we see a gun like that what do you want us to do if they don't lay it down well they did the right thing they shot him in places that didn't kill him and he's he's out of the hospital now and he's going to be fine but it's those kinds of conflicts that we get into without planning them I'm sure that 12 year old didn't go out and say hmm let me see if I can get the police upset this morning but the love that God has for us says love in action reaches out not only to the child that was shot, but to the officer who did the shooting. Because it's not, it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. People's feelings and what they believe are impacted. So then we go to peace. What do you think of when peace is mentioned? For most of the First definition of peace is the absence of conflict. There's no war, there's no conflict, there's no noise, confusion, disagreement, no quarrel. Everything is placid. I liken it to a body of water that's still. It never moves. That's the kind of peace we like because it's the easiest to deal with, but if that water never moves, it becomes the Dead Sea. And so with conflict, we need to learn how to live into it, deal with it, and not spread it around so anger doesn't get moved all over the place. It stays with God, and then God does what is needed. That's where the peace that passes understanding comes from. It's not like anything we would come up with. And God has come up with an excellent way. And that way was Jesus. Now, since Jesus' words look to his ascension, I think it's Thursday this week maybe. It's coming up soon. Um, we'll talk about it next Sunday. But since he was looking forward to that, it shows that his attention wasn't just on that particular moment. It was on that moment all the moments up to ascension, and then all the thousands and thousands and billions of moments after that. And how would people cope with his absence? Especially the people who had um, gotten so close to him, whose peace depended on his peace and his presence. And that's why those words come, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. His peace. It's a different sort of thing. It's hard to quantify if somebody said, well, what is it? It's a way of being in the world where things happen and you figure out how to deal with them without hurting yourself or someone else in the process. It's a way of being in the world where anger isn't our first response, although it is an appropriate response at times, where love and compassion are our first response. Responses. 
how to stay calm when everybody around you is falling apart. That's how one person I know put it. But Jesus said, that's my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is a scripture I often use in funeral services, memorial services, because it is such a comforting uh, word from Christ himself. Don't worry. I will be with you. My peace will help you deal with things. You don't have to do it by yourself. And whether it's grief or some other emotion that you're struggling with or some circumstances in your life, when I had a leak in my kitchen, it nearly drove me crazy. It happened in December. It was repaired two weeks ago. People who use their kitchens a lot will understand what that's all about. But I didn't clobber the man who came. I didn't call up and tell off the insurance company. I dealt with it from December to April. But now it's fixed and all is well. For now. God's peace tells me even if it gets trashed again, all is well. And that brings us to the third of the three things I mentioned, and that's gratitude. Gratitude is so underused, so underappreciated, so underestimated, and that's true in the church as well. Not just gratitude for things that have come your way in your life, or like um, Orthodox Jews used to do and say, I'm thankful I'm not a woman, you know. It is a sense of well-being that you have to share. It just comes out of you. It does it with some of the people who greet me every time I come here with the most beautiful smiles. It is in things like seeing the creation that God has given us even in the rain and, and loving what it is and appreciating it for what it is. And gratitude is foremost understanding that the gift that God gave us in Christ cannot be repaid. There's no way we can repay that. But we can live our lives in an attitude of gratitude so that uh, who we are to other people is one who knows that they are blessed and one who knows how to also share. Remember that hand motion? Practice it before you get up here. Put your hands out together. When you come up, when you are putting your hands out to receive communion, even though it says take, eat, you receive it. It's the symbols of God's gift to you again. Okay? That's just the bread, obviously. We don't want to put juice on your hands. Okay? Being open to God is working from a much larger perspective than we have, and that's, that's where we get hung up. We, we think from people point of view. Think from God point of view. Here's one story that's a good example. Ever heard of Ferdinand Magellan? Some of you kids in social studies and history will be hearing that now. In 1520, he battled for an entire year to find a passage in the oceans around South America. There at the very tip of the continent in its icy waters, he encountered some of the worst weather he had ever, ever encountered. And the crew was ready to quit. They just wanted to get out of there and get safe. But somewhere inside Magellan, and I don't know if it was Christ, but somewhere inside Magellan, there was this push because he understood that a way had been made. And they pushed through that awful, awful weather, and they came out into a beautiful body of water that was calm and storm-free, and he called it the peaceful one, the Pacific Ocean. It was there all the time. Now, he did it because he wanted good trade routes, but it was there all the time. God had already prepared it. So, 
In this reading this morning, Jesus is leading us in the way of love and in the place of peace. It's an opportunity for us to hear, once again, the gifts that we've been given and to be grateful. Um, to share God's gift, we have to receive them. We have to get our ego out of the way, and that's hard sometimes. Because to be truly grateful is to let God control our lives. We think we're in control, but if we are following Christ, Christ is in control. Once received, it's to be shared. Now, what that does is move us out of the center of our little universe and put us over to the side where we belong and put Christ back in the center where Christ belongs. Thanks be to God for an uncommon peace, love beyond any understanding, and peace that can carry us into a much richer, deeper, and more meaningful relationship with God. To God be the glory. Amen.